This morning I want to talk about expectations. Expectations of what church should be. Because we all have these expectations of what we expect in a church. And whether you've been attending this church for years or whether this is your first Sunday, uh, you have come with expectations. Uh, m- some of those expectations are based on how you might have grown up, a church that you grew up in. Some of those expectations are based on what you think church should be, based on what you read in the Bible. And some of that is accurate, some of that maybe not so accurate. Some of the things that we expect out of a church, we expect a place where we can worship God, a place to pray, a place to meet with God. Sometimes we expect uh, church to be a community to belong to, a community where we can be accepted. Sometimes we expect church to be a place to feel encouraged and loved. Sometimes we expect church to be a place where you can find your fit, where you can live out the God-given passions and gifts that he has given you. And having literally grown up in church, like I think week one, my first Sunday alive, I was in a church, and I've been in a church every Sunday since then for 44 years. Even when I go on holidays, I typically will find myself in a church somewhere. Some of the things that I have witnessed and experienced firsthand, worship sometimes, even though we're looking for a place to worship, it can be boring. It can be too loud. It can be too outdated. It can be too much like a concert. It can be too out of touch. A a community to belong and accepted. Sometimes church can be unfriendly. It can be standoffish. You can have awkward experiences with people who are way too friendly. (laughs) Who ask too many questions. Who seem too eager. Or maybe nobody talks at all. A place to feel encouraged and loved. Sometimes I've been a part of and been the target of hard conversations and hurt feelings and disappointment and rejection. A place where you can find your fit, yet you get overwhelmed or overlooked or not invited into the thing you want to do. Or worse yet, someone tells you that your giftedness isn't really a great fit for that particular ministry. Which leads to hurt feelings and disappointments and hard conversations as mentioned already. So the question is, why is there a disconnect between what we expect church to be and what our experiences of church have? And granted, this is this is like the lighthearted approach. Some people have had hard experiences in churches. Abuse. I've experienced emotional and verbal abuse from other pastors as a pastor. It's happened. It's a, it's a reality. We can experience some of those things. But the question still remains, whether it's a lighthearted take or a serious take, why is there a difference between the expectation and the reality? Part of it, if we're honest, is we sometimes have unrealistic expectations of what church should be. And in one sense, it's unfair to even call it an unrealistic expectation because when we come to church, we're expecting this. Is this not the, the place uh, where people uh, gather who have been redeemed and transformed by God, where God's very presence dwells among us? And so shouldn't his spirit be able to overcome anything and everything? There's going to be over-the-top expectations because the Spirit of God is involved. And so we expect God to show up and to do supernatural things. So maybe thinking about it, 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 that it's unrealistic is, is not so much about what God can do, but it's what people aren't doing. Because we think sometimes one of the unrealistic expectations we have is that in a church, everybody should be perfect. 
because we're all following God and God makes us perfect, right? But the problem lies in that very thing. We come into the disconnect because here we are, people, gathered together in one community, and any time you gather people together, you're going to get disappointed. <laughs> I know it sounds harsh, but, but I mean, it's pe- we're people. My sister often says, people be peopling. Like, it's, it's just, this, this seems to be a hard one for us to grasp, but we are inherently broken people. That's, that's what we are. We are broken people. We are not inherently good. As much as, as, much as you might want to think and buy into that nice lie that, that culture is trying to tell us that, that in our own nature, everybody's generally good. No. It's not true. I have lived in this world for 44 years, and I can testify from experience after experience after experience. We are not inherently good people. I am not an inherently good person. It's not there. Think about it this way, okay? Okay. Before a child is able to really even learn what it is to be good or bad, if you've had children, you know this. If you don't know this, you've turned a blind eye to this. I, I saw this thing years ago, and I saved it because this, it was phenomenal. Toddler's property laws. Let's look at this, exhibit A. Toddler's property laws. If I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. If I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. If it looks just like mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you are playing with something and you put it down, it becomes mine. If it's broken, it's yours. (laughs) I have witnessed this time and time and time again with my own kids, with other people's kids. This is the way we are wired. Before we learn how to live in society, We are inherently about one person. Me. Me. It's about me. What I want. What makes me feel good. What makes me happy. Irregardless of anybody else. Me. Right from the outset of sin entering this world, we see this brokenness at work in people. The four people that are listed in the Bible... One of them kills the other. Cain kills Abel because jealousy sinks into his heart right from the very beginning, and he doesn't like the fact that his brother's sacrifice is being accepted by God, but his is not. And so instead of figuring out why is my sacrifice not being accepted, I'm getting rid of my brother. We are not good people. We're not. But Jesus comes into the equation. And he is supposed to make this all better, right? I mean, this is what church is about. This is the place where we gather, we believe Jesus transforms us, changes us, shapes us, gets rid of that brokenness in us and brings healing into our lives. That he's the difference maker. He, he's the one, as I spoke last week, who has killed all of the giants and is freeing us from sin and death so, so if this church is his domain and we even have the cross out there on the parking lot that Jesus reigns here, that he is Lord here, shouldn't this be different? Yes, 
It should be different. It should be different. We see this time and time again. We just spent a, four, uh, 16 months going through the book of Acts. Churches are planted all over the Roman world. As people receive the message of the gospel, they are changed. They are transformed in Ephesus. Pagan practices and all sorts of spiritual witchcraft are done away with. Revival breaks out, the church starts, and things are just being transformed in people's lives. And then Paul, who plants this church, writes to them a few years later. And this is where I want us to look this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. In the church where Jesus reigns, where revival has broken out, where they have turned their lives over to the lordship of Jesus, Paul says to them halfway through the letter, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I urge you to do this. You know what that means, right? It means they weren't all doing that. Because why would he have to urge them to live the life worthy of the calling that they've received if they were all living the life worthy of the calling? Paul has just written to the church the first three chapters of Ephesus, reminding them of the blessing that God has poured out on them and ultimately also to us through Christ. He says that he has chosen us, he has saved us, he has brought us into his family, he has changed our very nature. He has made what was dead come alive. We are no longer enemies and rebels, but we are brothers and sisters. He's broken down the wall that divides us from himself and from each other, and he lives in us now. That's what Paul writes in the first three chapters of Ephesus. Beautiful book. And so in light of all of this, in light of everything that God has done for us through Christ, he calls us to live the life worthy of that. Literally, the word he used is walk balanced to this calling. Walk balanced to what God has called you and brought into your life. It, the calling is so high that we need to walk balanced to that. The idea of this calling is not about us being spiritually elite people. It's not about, oh, I, I'm called th to this and you're not called to that or whatever. It's, it's about we are called to follow Jesus. It's because we have responded to that call that we are a part of the church in the first place. That we've said yes to Jesus. And Jesus' call is very simple. Take up your cross and follow me. I.e., die to yourself and follow after me, learn from me, be with me, become like me. And you can only do that by taking up the cross. And this is the problem, and this is where the disconnect comes in. And this is why we have an expectation and unmet reality, because so many of us are still trying to live as the old us. We are not willing to die to the old us. We still want to live in that old place. We still want to have that, that selfish toddler, but what about me, Jesus? But what are you going to do for me? But what about this situation in my life? And Jesus says, you follow me. It's a question of lordship. You see, anywhere in your life where it's still about you, Jesus is not Lord over that. You're Lord over that. And that's where the struggle comes. Because every single one of us are trying to serve two kingdoms. We're trying to follow Jesus' kingdom and still trying to hold on to a little bit of our own kingdom. The old nature doesn't die easily. God has given us this gift of salvation in Jesus. This is the thing that he has called us to. And so in light of this calling, in light of the salvation that he wants to bring into your life, he tells us to walk in a way that is balanced with this salvation. You are blessed. You are saved. You are made alive. You are adopted into God's family. You're given the ability to live the life that brings fullness 
You are family. You're not rebels. You're not outsiders. So live like it. Let the way you walk out your life reflect that. Don't walk with your head down. Don't walk like a slave. Don't walk in your own path doing it your own way. You already did that. It didn't work, which is why we have turned to Jesus. Because we know that type of life doesn't end well. It leads to brokenness even more so. Addictions, heartache, broken relationships, messed up lives in every way, shape, and form. So Paul says you need to live the life worthy of the calling, to walk balanced in light of this calling. So what does that look like? Verse 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The walk that we are called to live out is the opposite of everything that is birthed in us as kids. It runs counter to most of the natural inclinations of our own hearts. Walk humbly. Walk humbly. What does that look like in a person's life? It's the death of pride. It's saying it's not about me. If I get zero recognition, I'm going to be okay with that. Huh. <laughs> it's not what I see witnessed in churches. It's not what I've seen witnessed in my own life at times. Walking humbly means the realization that all we have and all that is of any value flows from Christ, not from me. And if I really, truly believe that the only thing of value that I have in my life is coming from Christ, that sure helps me walk humbly because it says I really don't have that much to offer in and of myself. It's only as he takes it and shapes it and makes it something of value does it have value. We don't take ourselves too seriously when we live like that. We're able to laugh at ourselves a little bit. We're able to just de-stress in that moment. Because it's about what Jesus is going to do, not what I'm going to do. We realize that it's not about us, it's about him. And so whether we succeed or whether we fail, it's his success. Whether we succeed or whether we fail, it's his success. He is at work in us, bringing this about in us. So walk humbly and walk gently. Meekness. We've lost that idea in our society. What does meekness really look like? Meekness is not weakness. It's not a softness of heart or of attitude. Nobody would say that Jesus was weak, and yet he was meek, gentle. Not harsh. The most broken people were drawn to him because of that gentleness of spirit that resided within him. He drew people to himself through that gentleness. In fact, the, the Bible tells us that it is God's patience and kindness that leads people to repentance. And so what does a gentle life look like? I tell you what it doesn't look like. <laughs> When, when my wife cracks another dish because she slammed it off the cupboards because she's just so flicky on doing the dishes, and my initial reaction is, what are you doing out there? Instead of saying, maybe I should be helping with the dishes right now. <laughs> that's not gentleness, but that's the initial thing that comes up. And that has to die. That does not line up. That is not balanced to the life that I've been called to live. Walk patiently. Patience. The, Bible, the Bible's word for patience is long-suffering. Long-suffering. 
Why is patience so hard? Because you suffer a long time. It's what it is. It's enduring. It's, it's enduring without necessarily seeing that much of a change. It's about, it's about pushing through anyway because it's the right thing, not because it seems like it's making life easier. Patience and long-suffering is about the destination, not about where you are right now. It's about having your focus on the right thing. Are you heading in the right direction? Are you taking the right path? Because if you're taking the right path, the path may be really, really tough, but it's going to bring you to the right place. Patience is also about the waiting. The long periods of nothing. Of just doing the thing again and again. Because this is what God has called me to. Walking in love. Making allowances for people's faults. Giving people the room to make mistakes, grace to come alongside them, to help them when they do. Love to once in a while helpfully correct them instead of judgmentally jump on them. I'm not perfect. I need people to make room for my mistakes. If you put me on a pedestal, I am going to fail you horribly. Because I was never meant to be there. Love allows me to show that I'm not perfect and you're not perfect, but we are following a perfect Jesus and he will work in us as we walk it together. To give room for your shortcomings and your failures and you give room for my shortcomings and failures and I'll challenge you and you challenge me but we're going to walk it together. That's what love looks like. It's messy. It's hard. It doesn't flow naturally out of us but it's what we're called to. And walking in peace. All of this uh, keeping the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace Paul says. And when I, when I th hear that word, I can't help but go back. 2019 in Vancouver, Greg Mitchell, um, his talk on being the peaceful presence of Christ at our FCA conference, that has resonated with me. Four years later, it is still resonating with me. We need to be the peacemakers wherever we go. The peaceful presence of Jesus entering a room. And that cannot happen if it's not residing in us. If we are not peaceful people, we're not bringing peace where we go. We need his presence in us for that to happen. And, and in his talk, Greg Mitchell said, in a society, this was before COVID. This was before all of everything has transpired the last three years. In a society overrun with anxiety and fear, how much more so now? In a society overrun with anxiety and fear, the people walking in peace are the anomaly in that world. If we are the peaceful presence of Christ, the anxiety, the fear that exists in the room, we stick out like a sore thumb. But that doesn't reside in me naturally. Naturally, I'm worried. What is going to happen to the interest rates? What's going to happen to inflation? Man, we bought groceries on Saturday. Whoa. And like we were talking, like it has, it, like the price of stuff, it's just, it's just going nuts. And so we say, Lord, like how are you going to provide for your people if this stuff continues? Walk in peace. Walk in peace, trusting him day in, day out being his faithful servants, not being overrun with anxiety and fear and what if and what if and what about, but trusting 
one day at a time, each day as it comes. And if we are living this life worthy and balanced of the calling, that is when we will begin to experience unity. There is one body and one spirit, verse 4. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Paul's saying there is only one. Remember, the idea is not that we build these traits into our lives so that God will bless us. But instead, as we walk out the reality of the identity of Jesus living and breathing in us and through us, this is the life that's going to emerge. And this is what Paul is doing. He is drawing the church back to one Lord. There is one Lord over his church, one body, one spirit guiding and leading this whole thing. And he's saying, as you try to do it yourself, you are falling back into disunity again because it's not going to flow from you. Because remember what I've said, everything in us is broken and needs healing and needs wholeness. And it's only his spirit that's going to do that in us and through us. And so it's only as we submit to this one Lord and Father over all, one Savior Jesus, can we begin to walk in any semblance of unity. Our reality and identity is completely linked and tied to him. And so as we are with him, as we are submitting our lives to him, our will to him, our dreams to him, our pain to him, our brokenness to him, our failures to him, our crowns and our accomplishments, all of it submitted to him, then we begin to walk as he calls us to walk. The reminder here is that we are not called to make unity so much as we are to foster the unity that God shapes in us through his spirit. I need you to hear that. I need you to hear this. So I'm going to restate it. Our job is not to make unity happen. You can't do it. Unity is not natural. Unity is supernatural. It is really hard to live out because deep down, so much as we grow and look like adults, some of the childish ways of our lives stick with us. There's a reason I still play video games. Some of that childishness is still there. And we are all like that. I don't think about others most of the time. I think about myself. I think about how I feel. How does this make me feel? What am I going to get out of this? How is this going to benefit me? It's an immature way to live. And our society is wired to live that way. Live your truth. Really? Because if every single one of us lived our truth, we're in, we're in a lot of trouble. That, that's going to feed chaos and disunity. I'm called to live the truth of Jesus Christ. I'm called to submit my life to him and walk as he calls me to walk. The old Sprite slogan, obey your thirst, I mean, it hasn't changed. I mean, how old, like that was a commercial from 25 years ago. Nothing has changed. It's still the same thought. Do what makes you feel good. And if you live like that, you are not walking to the calling he's called you to. Unity will flow from the Spirit of God, not from you. You can't make it happen. It has to flow from his spirit because we are wired in the opposite way. And so when unity is not present in our lives, we have to step back and examine ourselves and say, where have I stopped the flow of the spirit in my life? What in my life 
is not allowing God's spirit to penetrate. If, if you are constantly at, at odds, and I'm not saying with the world. Jesus says the world's gonna hate us. But with brothers and sisters in the faith, if you are constantly at odds, this one and that one and the other one, you've got to stop back, step back and say, maybe, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe there's something in me. And ask the Holy Spirit to go to work to show you, because he desires to show us. We just don't always desire to see it. He wants unity to grow in his church. There's only one church, one Holy Spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And we look around and we say, how can, how can that be true? I mean, how many different churches are here in the city of Grand Prairie? You can't even, can't even get along, they all sit under one roof together. Exactly. Because we're full of people. And you look through the history of the church, we're f- it's full of people who are trying to make unity happen through our own power. And we can't do it because we can't agree on anything. Because there are areas in our lives where Jesus is not Lord. There are areas in our lives where Jesus is not Lord. And this shouldn't shock us. The aim for the church is unity, but it's not uniformity. We're not all going to be the same. We're not all meant to be the same. Verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Now I'm not going to dig, part of this is like the doctrine of the heroine of hell. I'm not going to get into that. That's a whole other sermon. Jesus descending, taking captives, ascending, all of that. That's a whole other topic. But the focus is this. As he ascended, he gave gifts to his church. And we are called to live those gifts out. Unity, but not uniformity. We're not the same. He has gifted us differently. He has empowered us differently. He's given us different abilities. He's wired us differently, given us different experiences. And so we are unique as people, but called to live in unity together. We're one, but we're not the same. Prophet Bono. Jesus has given diverse gifts to the church. The word that Paul uses for gifts is charis, graces. He has given graces to the church. They are not earned. They are gifts of his grace given to us. And Paul speaks specifically here of the roles within church leadership. The irony, it's debated what these roles mean and some churches split over how these roles should function in the church. And so the very gifts that he's given to bring unity, we use for disunity. That's how broken we are sometimes. These are not the only gifts God has given the church. There's gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, but here Paul specifically talks about some of the leadership gifts that he's given in the church. And the point that Paul is making here, and the point that I want to make from this message is that we are gifted differently for different purposes to bring unity to the body, to help us grow in the faith. The way God has gifted me is my gift. It's not your gift. And the way God has gifted you is your gift. It's not my gift. And so we've got to stop looking and comparing what we've been given to everybody else. We must each put to use what we have and not wish it was something different. I teach with a pastoral and sometimes prophetic bent. 
I can wish to be the apostle gifted to plant churches, to oversee groups of churches, or the evangelist gifted to communicate effectively for unbelievers. But these are not the gifts God has given me. God has given me and birthed in me teach the church, help them grow to mature. Because these are why all of these gifts have been given, so that we can all grow and mature. Jesus doesn't just call us to unity and say, now live that out. He calls us to it and then equips us for it. He equips us for it. He doesn't just leave us to our own devices. He empowers us to grow in this, enables us to grow in this. His spirit working in us will grow this in us as we live it out. As we walk it out. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. In living this out, in growing in our unity, which is founded by Jesus, through Jesus, God brings this diversity of body into being. Ligaments and muscles and bones. All these different things that work in our body come together to make one body. And trust me, when one muscle is out of sync, the rest of my body feels it. And so we need each other. And some of you are meant to be the muscles, some the ligaments, some the bones, some the feet, some the eyes, some the ears, some the belly button. All for a purpose. Even if we don't know what that purpose would be, like the tonsils. It's there for a purpose. We're there for a purpose. And we each have a purpose. And this is the beauty of us running this ministry fair every year. It shows us in this local church, here's what we're doing. Here's how we're growing. Here's how we're serving. Here's how you can get connected to do that. And we need you doing that. Church doesn't exist if we're not walking out our faith in Jesus in tangible, real ways. Intentional in our growth. Intentional in pouring out to one another. Fads are going to come and go. The immature are going to chase after whatever fad is in at the moment. For video gamers, Starfield, I guess, you're on that fad, and it comes and goes. But that's what kids do. They, wanna, they want the new and cool thing because it's the cool thing. But is it useful? It's the cool thing. It's going to make me look cool, so it's useful until next month when it's not cool anymore. Like certain words. I won't use them. Chloe's like, don't do it, Dad. Don't do it. <laughs> They're fads. They come and go. The problem is many kids don't always grow up to become adults. They just grow up to become big kids. Now some of that is okay. It's okay to have a childlike perspective sometimes. It's okay to be able to have fun like a child sometimes. But in our maturity, we need to grow. And the same things happen sometimes spiritually. We chase after a new high, a new fix, a new teaching, a new thing, a new form of worship, a new way to worship, a new whatever. Some churches have split over the fad. And this is why we need maturity. So that spiritual matters would not chase after every nuance of teaching and deceit that comes about. But instead that we would grow up and become more like Jesus. Who fits us all together in unity. 
And growing up is not always easy. I don't know if you remember as a kid growing pains in your legs. Do you, anybody have that? Growing pains? I mean, it would keep you up. It would keep you awake. It was painful. That was your, 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 your stretching out. Your muscles, your ligaments are stretching as you grow. Like My kids went through a phase where they grew like four inches in a couple of months. And it was just like, this is crazy. No wonder there's growing pains. The growing pains of stretching yourself as you leave high school and go into the workforce or go to college, start a family. The growing pains of having to take care of your own home and your own finances and doing all of those things. The growing pains of marriage and parenting and raising ki kids, learning to fight well with your spouse. Some people still haven't learned that. To share to live life together as a family. The unity that God calls us to is not always smooth. Sometimes it's very painful. Sometimes it's hard. But there's a learning, a growing involved in this maturing in the faith. It's not instant. It takes time. It takes intentionality. It's not going to happen overnight. And so you have to give it time. And you have to dig in. And so I urge you, in light of what God has called us to, let's live a life worthy of that calling. I want to conclude with this. I want to pray for you out of the same prayer that Jesus prayed for you. Literally. There's one prayer in the Bible that Jesus literally prayed for you and me. It's found in John 17. Jesus is praying for his disciples, and near the end of the prayer, he says this, my prayer is not for them alone, talking about his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that's us, so that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. So that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus, I pray amen to your prayer. So be it, Lord, that unity would flow among your church. Jesus, you ask the Father to make this a reality. I pray this again, just as you have prayed, Lord. Make us one so that the world will know that you are who you say you are and that they may be brought to a place to believe and join with us as well. Lord, may unity flow in your people as we find our place, as we grow in the gifts that you have given us, as we learn to walk out in peace and in love and humility and gentleness with one another, Lord, bearing with one another our shortcomings challenging one another, speaking the truth in love to one another so that we can grow and not be deceived and led astray. Jesus, you have done all of the heavy lifting, but now we have to walk this out in our lives. We have to allow your spirit to do the work in the places that res still resist you. Lord, in the areas where my selfishness is still Lord, help my will to crumble there, that that kingdom becomes yours as well. Lord, I pray the same prayer for all of my brothers and sisters, that we might be brought to unity as we care for one another, as we encourage one another, as we strengthen one another, as we build one another up, as we challenge one another, as we cry with one another, as we laugh with one another, that we might be built up in unity, Lord. One faith, one hope, one Lord, 
Jesus Christ over all. Lord, I pray this for your church today. In Jesus' name, amen.